Have you ever watched a film about two old friends who eat dinner and chat? A surface level analysis of My Dinner with Andre will see viewers turned away from what sounds like the most boring film on the planet. I can assure you, however, that it is not. The story surrounds two people who work in the theatre industry. Andre, a renowned director who has recently put the theatre behind him, recalls his time spent out in the wilderness experiencing theatre in the most ritualistic ways imaginable. His table partner, Wally, works for the theatre in a desperate capacity, frustrated busy with writing and distributing plays and getting acting work when he can just to pay the bills. The collision of these two friends makes this encounter so thrilling to watch unfold. You half expect one to be at the other's throat by the end of the meal as a result of their conflicting philosophies and lifestyles. It's no wonder it's been referenced multiple times in popular culture. <laughs> Thirsting for a way to name the unnameable, to express the inexpressible. Tell me more! And yet, oddly, I don't know a single friend or family member who has actually seen this film before. Hence why I am first and foremost introducing it to you, my dear viewer, with an analysis to shortly follow in the hope that it will bring some insight into the particular nuances laid within this strange little film. So, go and give this film a watch, and come back for the analysis when you're done. Our film begins with our focal character Wally narrating over shots of him walking through New York City. From the offset of this film, and this is confirmed by an interview with Sean by Criterion, we find our character to be driven by fear. These shots display him as tiny amidst the backdrop of towering urban environments. Even a honking truck seems to awaken him from his sleep. He appears absolutely weather-beaten, not by the weather of course, but the day itself. The slack jaw, the narration, and his entrance into the graffitied subway train, all displaying the monotony of his city life. We may initially conclude that he longs to escape from such a life, but as his dinner with Andre will prove, this may not entirely be the case. The whole affair of him going to dinner in the first place sounds like it will be a waste of time to him. How he's completely intimidated by the front of house, and then further alienated by the severe lack of club sodas, not understanding a word on the menu, we can tell this guy is severely out of his depth. When Wally's dinner partner shows up, his general attitude displays a level of awkwardness and social ineptitude. He settles with the idea of asking Andre questions, like an interviewer. This seems suitable for the audience, seeing as we know all about Wally from his narration thus far, but nothing about the mystery man who has invited him to dinner. This then leads into the long, overly elaborate tales of Andre's adventures outside the theatre world. Instead of operating blindly within it to keep the cogs of the industry turning, he questions theatre's purpose purpose whilst working closely with Polish theatre director Jerzy Grotowski. Grotowski is most well known for his theory of poor theatre, in which performances remove the lavish costumes, detailed sets and music. This is done to favour both the skill of the actors but also their relation with the audience itself. Grotowski would later move on to explore a notion called paratheatre, which he was exploring during the time Andre dropped out of the theatre. This idea attempted to transcend the separation between performer and spectator spectator, meaning that the audience were in many cases part of the performance itself. These led to impulsive performances with an emphasis on improvisation, where the people involved are the characters as well as being themselves. This may sound like a strange concept, but we're not really talking about theatre in the conventional sense. These were mostly invited performances that were closer to communal rituals than anything else. One example of these, as detailed by Andre in the film, is The Beehive, where 100 people come into a room, and that's it. This is the first time in the film where Roger Ebert's observation that the actors in this film enable the audience to picture the story as it's being told, as Andre delivers this huge monologue about what he experienced. Imagining oneself being in the room as a blind participant and also the dictator of a hundred people is just a crazy thought. This was where Andre compared the event to Hitler's Nuremberg rallies, which was where I started to get a funny feeling the guy was going to eventually aspire to be a Nazi dictator, but of course that 
never happens. He only guided the group with movement, repetition, and song. The fruitful language that colours this imagination is also thoroughly inspiring to me. This common idea of showing and not telling is completely turned on its head in this film. Picturing Andre passing this teddy bear back and forth with a human kaleidoscope in view, it really draws you in to hear more about this crazy private occasion. You kind of get suspicious that this was just a hallucinogenic drug trip. After all, Andre Andre is alluded to at the beginning of the film as totally losing it for months. However, I found myself truly believing what he was saying. It was so full of conviction because if you had experienced something like what he describes, you'd want to share it as though you were sitting around a campfire or something. The characters, and by extension the audience, are then pulled back from the primordial past back into civilization with the story drawing to a close and the camera zooming out to see the stiff elderly waiter standing behind them arranging their first course. This is the beautiful ritual of the dining experience though. You become deeply entranced by the conversation only to have the waiter pull you right out of the trance and then suddenly you remember that hunger is a thing. Throughout the film these interactions with the staff always do seem to come at times when one or the other has just finished telling one of their tales, acting to give the film a little structure and grounding in reality. Whenever it happened though it did strike me as a bit odd that neither of them ever said thank you to to the waiter at any point during their meal. What is equally disorienting for the viewer, bear with me here, is the connection between Andre's separation from the theatrical world and the actual separation we as the audience experience with this performance we are witnessing being on film and not on stage. With Andre's involvement in the beehive, we come to realise the actors are the characters. So you follow the same law of improvisation, which is that you do whatever your impulse as the character tells you to do, but in this case, you are the character, so there's no imaginary situation to hide behind, and there's no other person to hide behind. This weird blurry line that's barely established between actor and character makes the circumstances of this film's existence all the more fascinating. The story of the film is based on events in the actors' lives, yet both actors have denied that they play themselves in effect when interviewed by Roger Ebert. The actor-writers taped their conversations two or three times a week for three months and then worked for a year shaping the material into a script in which they play comic distillations of themselves. I'm sure this film would have had Stanislavski jumping for joy, another theatre practitioner who would encourage his actors to use their own personal experiences when creating emotion in their performances. Andre then begins his next story about Kozan, a Japanese Buddhist priest, who he believed to be the Little Prince, a character from a novel by Antoine de Saint-Exupéry. Andre, the priest and two actors work on the play in the Sahara Desert, where Andre seems to discover a form of desperation over his existence. The camera goes in for a super long zoom during the climax of this story, yet it's so fantastical that you can't help but wonder if the guy was on drugs or something. And yet, it all still seems totally plausible whilst listening to him that his mind could picture such fantasies with the desperation he describes. Visions of birds coming out of his mouth when looking at his rear view mirror, meditating and picturing his wife growing old and dying, eating sand, going to mass with his family and the priest, only to imagine a minotaur with blue skin and flowers growing out of its eyes, hitting creative rock bottom after discovering your inability to write a play after finding finding success must be the most soul-crushing thing to endure. Memory being the fickle thing that it is, these might have all been nightmares and he's just retelling it in a fantastical way for the sake of the film? Who knows? The next story starts with a flag of a Tibetan swastika that Andre seemed naturally inclined towards having. Many may not know that the symbol originated far earlier than the 1930s in Germany, with it symbolising divinity and prosperity in many East Asian countries. Once again, Andre flirtation with Nazism seems to creep into the conversation like a ghoul lurking in the corner of the restaurant. If he previously witnessed hallucinations, his descent into delusion seems to take place when he actually acquires the swastika flag. How the flag made his wife afraid, nauseous and repulsed is symptomatic of his disassociation with reality. An even stranger coincidence to consider is that Andre's performance group was called the Manhattan Project, sharing its 
name with the nuclear weapons program that created the bombs that destroyed Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Right after this though, the final experience Andre relates is of being buried alive on Halloween. The camera once again moves ever so, ever so slowly towards Andre, this time ending with a proper close-up on his face by the end to get the imagination flowing. With him recounting how he was taken into a basement to write his last will and testament, the background noise of the restaurant stopped, as though all surroundings were frozen in time. If there was ever a point in the film where I was most engaged in his stories, it was here. All the build-up to it and this unique and exceptionally long take, I mean, what a ritual, what an unbelievable experience. Even my heart just swelled up with fear at the very notion of what he went through and how he just submitted to it all. By the end of his tale though, I genuinely felt like I would want to be a part of a resurrection ceremony like that. I was questioning whether I could go through with such a thing or not. I truly do not know. I mean, how do you even find people to group up with to be part of such a ceremony? Once again, we snap back into reality with this long shot with the waiter serving their main meal. Bit weird though, I don't remember them even ordering chicken. We didn't order chicken, not a problem, we'll pick it out. With dinner arriving, Andre's back to talking about the Nazis. The mere mention of Albert Speer, Adolf Hitler's architect, you initially think that he's truly lost the plot. However, his comparison to the man is delivered in a very reflective manner. It's conceivable that what he's done for the past few years are, to him, horrific. A very harsh self-criticism indeed, but the reflection makes for quite a redemptive moment that satisfies his weird flirtations with the Third Reich. Him saying that several family members had grown ill or died recently allows him to come face to face with his behaviour and return to the theatre for the sake of grounding him back into reality. How he can perceive himself as a bad guy is quite something to realise. To even admit to a friend that you can see the rot growing inside you takes some courage. The strangest thing is that he then turns this blame onto the world at large and how people are living in this dream state in New York. In contrast to his life-affirming experiences, coming back into the life of normality just makes him sick, reflecting that line from the beginning of the film. I could always live in my art, but never in my life. Wally then speaks up for the first time without a question, relating to Andre when he speaks about his experience as an actor. They find common ground about honesty and expressing feelings directly, something that's supposedly uncommon in New York. Andre claims that, like himself, Grotowski gave up theatre too, because people were so good at performing in their lives that the theatre was just obscene and superfluous. The same can be said of these two actors creating a performance out of their dinner conversations. They discuss this bloody fantastic idea that people are trying so hard to live up to a fantasy expectation of a role they must enact that they themselves become actors actors on a stage of their own making. By performing these roles all the time, we're just hiding the reality of ourselves from everybody else. We usually don't know the things we'd like to know, even about our supposedly closest friends. If your life is organized around trying to be successful in a career, well, it just doesn't matter what you perceive or what you experience. You can really sort of shut your mind off for years ahead in a way. You can sort of turn on the automatic pilot. Our minds are just focused on these goals and plans, which in themselves are not reality. No. And because people's concentration is on their goals, in their life they just live each moment by habit. The conversation diverges, however, when Andre says this. Things just very rarely go haywire now. And if you're just operating by habit, then you're not really living. Because Wally suddenly realizes that his habits are what keep him living. Things in life do in fact go haywire, more so for those that are surviving as opposed to existing. A battle between order and chaos is constantly happening in reality, with Andre advocating for more chaos in your life to stop you from falling into a trance, and Wally appreciating the order and routine of his. They discuss having an electric blanket, which disincentivizes you to snuggle up to somebody for warmth. Andre considers comfort to be a negative thing as you won't want to come out of that state of comfort once you're in it. He even likes the cold, which, 
oddly, I can relate to. I am a bit of a Wim Hof fan myself and consider hopping into a cold shower to be a worthwhile thing to do, much to the disbelief of my friends and family. You not only remove that prolonged feeling of being cold after the shower, but it's like voluntarily entering a state of discomfort and realising your worries were for naught. Of course, on the flip side, there's Wally, who may have to deal with a poorly insulated apartment for months at a time. He's obviously not living it up in some lavish apartment or house or mansion as Andre seems to be, and so a separation between their existences becomes starkly clear. Wally got the electric blanket because there's no escaping the cold, whereas Andre seeks the cold because he's surrounded by comfort from the wealth he's accumulated. I would never give up my electric blanket, Andre, I mean, because uh, New York is cold in the winter, I mean, our apartment is cold. I'm trying to protect myself because really there are these abrasive beatings to be avoided everywhere you look. Suddenly it becomes clear that Andre has just drunk the Kool-Aid on everything that surrounds him. It seems almost like he's developed some confirmation bias that whatever he hears or reads that agrees with his form of spirituality is just taken as gospel. Ideas about spirits being tied to the tables and chairs, a story of a lady Hatfield who starved because she ate nothing but chicken, Wally's scientific and humanistic approach to existence allows him to develop some scepticism and see through some of the bullshit his friend has accumulated. Only with Wally taking the hot seat does it feel like he too has something profound to share. The way that he accepts the whole world as not being his problem and only becomes his problem when he writes is a really interesting idea. I think that psychologically this idea of writing to confront the world makes total sense. They both agree in the belief that theatre is a form of sharing that confrontation with reality, but of course a director has an entirely different scope of reality than the playwright. It was interesting that the camera did slowly zoom in on Andre as he was about to tell another tale, but because it was so short-lived with the actress rejecting the idea of using a real human head as a prop, so such completion of the zoom never takes place. Like with Grotowski, Brecht gets brought into the picture in relation to theatre's purpose. Another theatre practitioner, his ideas were, like Andre's, supportive of forcing the audience to see the world as it is rather than falsify it. The idea that we should suspend our disbelief when experiencing theatre is something I've never really truly subscribed to either. This is probably why I find myself agreeing with Andre when he discusses how theatre shouldn't make people sleep easier. Of course, Wally has an entirely different perspective. If life is so hard and tough to begin with, why would people want to be reminded of that in the theatre? Andre actually finds himself realising that putting on contemporary and reality reflecting plays actually lulls people further into the sleep than dragging them out of it. How does it affect an audience to put on one of these plays in which you show that people are totally isolated now? Because I think it's very likely that the picture of the world that you're showing them in a play like that is exactly the picture of the world they have already. This seems to be more true than ever at the time of writing this video, seeing as a global pandemic has given everybody something to worry about already. The real heartbreaker conclusion they arrive at, though, is that people have to be directly involved in the performance in order for them to have a real experience at the modern theatre. Why else would Andre go to all these places and live such bizarre existences if not to arrive at this conclusion? I believe this is equally true of video games and their current popularity. This film was produced when video games were in their infancy, but if these two could be shown something like virtual reality, they would probably hypothesise that these surreal experiences of being christened in a forest or buried alive could potentially be brought into the living room. However, VR could be seen as putting people to sleep further as well. Why would people want to face reality if their virtual reality is so good? Then the pair try to find why they believe people are so bored with their lives. Andre voices this crazy paranoid opinion that the culture we've created for ourselves turns us all into robots in the machinery of an Orwellian nightmare. To me, it seems to be a rather simplistic conclusion when applied to a city as complex as New York and to suggest 
whilst it stretches out to the rest of the world, only makes sense to me if we're talking about shopping centres, but that's beside the point. Again though, all of Andre's theory comes from hearsay of people he's met and talked to, which is exactly what leads Wally into his own tirade about scientific thought and how it's given society so much. In almost debate-like fashion, Andre rejects science and retorts with him believing a language of interconnectedness is possible in order to understand everything, which is such a strange idea because reality is so infinitely large and unknowable. It kind of ignores the power and utility of language as a whole. The frown on Wally's head seems to only increase with intensity the more Andre talks about this, as acting and playwriting would no longer exist without language. How would these two even express these beautiful philosophical ideas without language? He also claims that New York has been brainwashed when he can't even conceive that he himself might be brainwashed. In response to Andre talking about a roof that can contact UFOs, possibly the most balmy idea of the lot, Wally gives his actual response. I don't really know what you're talking about. Ideas are indeed infectious, but that doesn't make them gospel. I believe, though, that Andre is ultimately seeking an escape from responsibility, which Wally, and myself included, take as the source of meaning in our existences. He has a list of errands, I have a content schedule. During the closing moments of the film, I thought it was great seeing the staff cleaning up the restaurant with these two still nattering on, probably anxious for them to leave. Seeing them also reflected in the mirror adds to this intensity that their conversation will inevitably come to an end. The mirror is also used rather effectively during the dinner itself. By placing Andre in the frame right next to Wally's face, it feels like we're going to see this potentially ugly side of Andre come out as Wally comes to his brave conclusion about what he's just had to listen to for the past hour. As the conversation wound down, I found myself questioning my own working life and my position in the world itself. Andre Andre believes that living mechanically is no way to live, but neither is living on impulse to just do what your heart tells you. Making YouTube content for seven years has made me realise that maybe I should move on and find something else to do. Was it better, more enjoyable when YouTube was my hobby? Probably, but at the same time, the most part-time work I've had, just to keep the income up, made me so miserable that I simply yearned not to do such work again. Maybe one day I will change. Maybe I'm just too comfortable. There's a really great moment too when Andre emphasises cutting out the noise in order to understand himself. A car horn sound effect is then heard in the background, making me realise such an exercise is easier said than done. It seems to be what prompts Wally to discuss his rejection of unconscious impulses and aggression in a Freudian manner. This leads them to discuss and explain why encounters with other people are so scary. They're all complex, multi-layered beings with years of experience hidden away behind their face. We don't really know people because we ourselves keep so much inside. Instead of discovering ourselves and others, we resort to the roles we are assigned by society and live up to the expectations of said roles. Father, wife, son, daughter, playwright, theatre director, YouTube content creator. We return to the fold with the idea of us all acting in modern society and not realising who we are as individuals. This is why Andre's final lines about a father holding hands with his son hold so much resonance. Our identities from birth to death will remain largely a mystery to everyone around us. We are given these titles and categories to convince ourselves that we aren't just going to sink into the earth and stay there in a state of inertia for the remainder of our lives. Or maybe it's the opposite. Maybe those roles do exactly that. Wally's narration then begins again, muting out the conversation of paying the bill, a trifling matter that we know the words to without needing to hear them. Wally's dinner with Andre prompts thoughts reminiscent and feelings to his mind as the buildings pass by. 
as though he'd completely forgotten them. To think that sitting around a campfire, or in this case a dinner table, would then be related to Wally's girlfriend Debbie at another theoretical campfire in their cold apartment, giving the film an almost reigniting feeling of clarity. We have experiences, and then we pass on those experiences to others in the most mesmerising form of storytelling, the spoken word. Thanks for watching. This video was brought to you by a very generous supporter on Patreon. I'd love to hear if you have any thoughts about this film, even if you found it to be utterly boring. I look forward to reading your discussions in the comments section below.